He was trained in Argentina um, uh, and uh, had uh, a fellowship with uh, Danny Prevedello and Rick Corral and is uh, doing a fantastic work uh, in Argentina. So uh, Miguel, please go ahead. Looking forward to see your presentation. So thank you for inviting me to this meeting. It's an honor for me to be here with you. Thank you, João Paulo. Um, uh, I'm going to present a case of a supracellular tumor. Uh, so I, I chose a, a long video in order to, to share tips and pearls and a, a little uh, introdu introduction that we all know that supracellular tumors are really challenging tumors. They grow in uh, the supracellular space we, the, it's uh, full of neural vascular structures and they compress the optic apparatus and they involve the pituitary stock. So um, this is a case of a 12 year old girl who came to us with a visual loss, headaches and vomiting. So here we are, the, um, the CT scan. We have a um, supracellular tumor, uh, uh, intraventricular tumor inside the third ventricle with hydrocephalus. Uh, it's also calcified. So here we have the, the MRI that shows an uh, intra-extraventricular tumor. Uh, it seems to be um, a large crime vine joma. So in this let kind me of, see. Yes, Miguel. If uh, if I I'm gonna just if you're okay with that, I just gonna let me see who I'm gonna get here to to discuss some of the details with us. I don't know if Ansh is here. I can't see him, so maybe he's already in the OR. But uh, but let's see. Ala Ala Montazer has a great experience with those cases as well. So Ala, I mean, uh, we agree that it looks like a cranial pharyngioma, but in terms of compartments and spaces where this cranial pharyngioma apparently is going and growing into, what what is your impression? Oh well, yeah, it's sort of like cellular supracellular going to the third ventricle and the interparietal cisterns as well. Um, it's causing some sort of like hydrocephalus as well. She is twelve year old, so one should bear in mind, you know, the pneumatization of uh, of the sinuses. They're not an obstacle, but it's something that you you know you can bear in mind um, thinking about an approach for um, for these patients. Um, I think it's it's sort of like pre and retro infundibular in terms of like uh, an AP extension. Um, I see a hint of the infundibulum right, you know, towards the pituitary attachment there, uh, but I lost it in the supracellular compartment going all the way to the hydro uh, to the hypothalamus. Um, but yeah, this is uh, this is my take on the uh, on the MRI. Yeah, I was just as I'm looking at this image here, like uh, although apparently like uh, largely contained from lateral to lateral by the chiasmatic cistern in the most, you know, the supracellular component, there are two points that, I mean, certainly the calcifications makes, you know, makes it like a challenging tumor. The other point is the extension all the way to from in a moon roll uh, on the top. And the second yeah. point is this component that apparently crosses through the... Uh, <laughs> Liliquist membrane going into the prepontine cistern as well, posterior to the dorsal cella, that uh, would require some you know, additional surgical maneuvers to be you know removed there right in front of the basilar. But uh, okay, Miguel, maybe go ahead. Let's see. So I um, I like to use for this kind of tumor the uh, classification that Steno made that he classified the tumors. Uh, 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 one kind of tumor is when they are in the cisternal uh, part of the supracellular space outside the third ventricle, and the other kind of tumor uh, is uh, an intra-extraventricular tumor, uh, like this in this case. So uh, these kind of tumors they are growing uh, inside the floor of the third ventricle and inside the pituitary stalk, so they involve both hypothalamus and the pituitary stuff also. So I think you can choose uh, to approach this kind of tumor 
um, by a, or by an open approach like a terrenal or an endoscopic endonasal approach. I really do prefer the endoscopic endonasal approach because you have a better visualization of the pituitary gland, the pituitary stock, and this tumor is in the retrochiasmatic space. And then you have a nice view of both hypothalamus and you are really allowed to do your best decision in terms of dissecting the tumor from both hypothalamus. If I may, if I may, uh, just in terms of approach here, I mean, I fully agree that you would have the option of the two then, but I have to say that if I were to not do endoscopic, which I would do endoscopically as well, uh, if I had to go from above, I don't know if I would go with a Terriano for that one uh, because of the extension up to the foramen of Monroe. Uh, I wonder what you think, Miguel, and of course others about, uh, for example, you know, going transcoroidal from above, opening, uh, you know, the you know the choroid plexus and and then going through the ventricles to remove this all the way to the base because when there is such a superior component uh, in the inside the third ventricle, in my opinion, it's it's uh, sometimes very challenging with a frontolateral approach. So that that's I, one option. Sure. So uh, I I like to use the transcoroidal approach only uh, with uh, the papillar in German, that they are purely inside the third ventricle. It's almost 2% of the cases, and I really do prefer this approach. But when uh, it's an intra-extraventricular tumor, the problem is in the floor of the third ventricle. So when you resolve the problem of the floor of the third ventricle, the superior part uh, is going to go down. Mm-hmm. I see your point. I mean, uh, and, and it makes sense. The one thing here in this case is that my impression is that, you know, this tumor has already kind of like almost open like this space in the floor, the third ventricle as it came apparently from the stock and, and went up like this. So uh, I think that the concerns with hypothalamic function, which are real, um, would be kind of like similar in, in my impression, of course, but and then the calcifications in the apsilateral side, I think, would be very difficult to be dealt with a teriono. But anyways, I definitely agree with you that <laughs> that if we have an endoscope available in expertise, the endoscopic in the nasal, it's it's the way to go. Yeah. Okay. So I'm trying to share the video. Here is the endoscopic in the nasal approach, a cellular and supracellular exposure. The, here we can see the pituitary gland and the pituitary stock. So first we have to dissect the, the arachnoid around the tumor. So the tumor is really big. So we always start doing a, a internal decompression of the tumor. We debulk the tumor in order to gain space for an extracapsular dissection. So first we resect piece by piece. Here we, here we have the dorsum cellar. So now we're trying to, to do an, an extracapsular dissection of the tumor. Here we can see that the pituitary stack, stack completely open. I like to use this uh, curve ring curette for this kind of, of tumors. So we, we resect uh, some pieces of the tumors in order to, to have more space. Now we are trying to get the plane of dissection of the left hypothalamus. We resect a, li a little bit of tumor because we don't have a, a more space and we continue in, this is the left hypothalamus. We are trying to push the tumor to the midline. So the plane of dissection of the left hypothalamus is visible. Now we continue the dissection to the superior part. Notice that the and um, the dissection of the hypothalamus is a superior dissection of the hypothalamus. Here we are in the superior part. 
the ventricle is open. We are near to the foramen of Monroe. We are pushing the tumor down. We continue the, the, the dissection of the tumor all the way around. Now we are trying to go to the other side. Here we have the right hypothalamus. So Pablo say that the membrane liliquist is involved in this case. Now we are going to see the liliquist. Here we have in the inferior part. We resect a, a little bit of tumor. So we are pushing the tumor upwards so we can see the membrane of Liliquist and the posterior circulation is downy. We continue the dissection. So the left hypothalamus is completely dissected from the tumor. Now we are in the right hypothalamus. This is the posterior part of the third ventricle. So the left hypothalamus is free, tumor free. We have um, more additions in the right hypothalamus. I think this is the last addition to the right hypothalamus. Here we are again in the posterior part of the third ventricle and we move to the top of the tumor. And here we have the, in, so the interthalamic mass. We are dissecting the tumor from the interthalamic mass. And so we dissect the tumor all the way around and then we take it out. So I think that the beauty of this approach is that you can uh, see all of these uh, neurovascular structures. Uh, for me, it's the best approach to preserve these important structures. Um, so here we, we have the beauty of this approach. Uh, you can see uh, the posterior circulation, then the posterior part of the third ventricle, the avenula, aqueduct. The interthalamic mass. Here we can see both thalamus and both hypothalamus. The H is the hypothalamic sulcus. And then with, with an angle scope, we can see the foramen of Monroe. Here we are in the superior part of the, of the ventricle. And with an angle scope, with this, this view, we can see both hypothalamus. So in the right side, we have this superior dissection of the right hypothalamus. And to the other side, we have a better, a better plane of dissection of the right of the left hypothalamus. This is the posterior circulation. The dorsum cella, the internal carotid artery, and the optic pathway. This is the chiasm that is in the top. Um, this is the last view of the third ventricle, and we reconstruct the skull base with cut inside the dura, fascia lata, and the nasoceptal flap. Here we have the pre and post operative MRI. Pre and post operative MRI. This is the complete CT scan. With pneumocephalus and the postoperative MRI that shows a good resection with the skull base reconstruction.
So the patient did well, she developed hypopituitarism, no CSF leak, no need to shunt, and uh, with visual improvement. So thank you so much. Do you have any questions? Just let me know. Uh, beautiful case, Miguel. I mean, uh, I I do have uh, you know a few questions and comments about you know how how you you see those you know th the management of those cases. Uh, but uh, let me start actually opening to to our participants. So I see Dr. Vargas, uh, you know, was sharing a few comments here. Dr. Vargas, you wanna you wanna comment? Oh yeah, Miguel. Uh, thank you and. Um... I think we lost Dr. Vargas. I think you're muted, sir. One one question. Yes. Yes. You hear me? Okay. Yeah. Now we do, Dr. Vargas. Okay. Uh, one question, Miguel. Uh, the approach that you use for this is um, a white endoscopic endonasal approach or the simple approach? Because I miss at the beginning you were doing a transesphenoidal approach, which the pituitary stock and things, but did you do an, an um, advanced endoscopic approach or just at uh, a limit of the normal approach that we do for pituitary? Yes, it's, uh, it's a bigger approach. I usually uh, use an ethmoidectomy for this kind of tumor when we have to do a, a bimanual dissection. Uh, uh, also, we uh, we achieve a cellar and a supracellar approach. In this patient, uh, because uh, she was a twelve-year-old, uh, she it's a, a small um, it's a small approach. But uh, in, in adults, I prefer to do a bigger approach. But, but I mean, you went anterior, yes, not, not only on the cellar. Uh, yes, I open in the supracellar space, transtuberculum, and a little bit of the planum spinalidale. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful approach. Excellent. Okay. Uh, I see that Dr. Diego Gonzalez wants to comment as well. Diego, please. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, JP, and thank you, Dr. Great Case. I just want to. Uh, and give you a comment because when I was in my training with Dr. Hakim, we performed all the craniofrangiomas through the, I mean, uh, with a subfrontal craniotomy translamina terminalis. And I remember that maybe we can remove most of the tumor, but the patient stayed in the intensive care unit trying to go through the hypothalamic storm for three weeks, one month. And, and I had, I, my, my memory, it's about to, the post-operative was very complex. So I complete with Dr. Hakim, maybe three years doing through the nose. And the most important thing, even though we, now we have a more complete resections like, like this very, very uh, similar that, this case is that the patient go very, very well comparing with the transcranial approach, especially with the hypothalamic uh, result. So it's amazing how working inside on the tumor, we can respect more the hypothalamus. I think for us and for me, this kind of surgery changed completely the postoperative of all those patients. It's amazing how the recovery is and we're not now, we're not afraid about the postoperative because most of the patients go very, very well after surgery because I think the approach is very, very helpful uh, when we are talking about the hypothalamic care. Thank you, JP, and very nice case. We really love this surgery. I'm pretty sure Dr. Hakim, because the last two months we operated actually two cases very similar and, and it's amazing how the patients when we see the MRI, we're very happy, but when we see the patients recovering very well, that's the most important thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diego. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Beautiful comment. Um, I saw Dr. Quinones here. Dr. Q, 
Let me see. I know that you're in the ABNS. Can you hear you're me? In now. Yes, Can you perfect. Hear me? Can you see me? Good. I was just paying attention. I just came in uh, just a few minutes ago, Miguel, and I just watching your video and ah, uh, fascinated, you know, enchanted, thrilled. I mean, it's just such a beautiful surgery, extraordinary resection. It just tells us how some of you, many of you, including Diego, JP, yourself, many people are teaching us the art of pushing ourselves beyond what we thought it was possible. Most of us train, we're doing a lot of this, as Diego said, transcranial, that to see the surgery, to see the beauty, to see the resection, to see the respective pain, vessels, you know, the hypothalamus, just absolutely thrilling. And I congratulate you, congratulate everybody for, you know, like I said, for pushing us beyond what we thought it was imaginable. Beautiful case. Thank you for, for allowing me to say a few words. I'm actually at the American Board of Neurological Surgeon. I had to review a lot of cases and stuff. But uh, I just said, I got to come in for a few minutes to make sure that this team is changing the world today. <laughs> Good, man. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Quinones. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. For Miguel, if, <laughs> Miguel, if you allow me, I have, uh, I have two questions for you. So uh, the first one is actually about, you know, even before starting the, the, the surgery as well. Like, so this patient, uh, as you're showing the image, had some, you know, pretty large ventricles. Uh, with some components uh, to me of hydrocephalus. So considering that I would proceed with endoscopic as you, I would I would probably, depending of course on the symptoms of the patient is so, but I would have very little hesitancy in placing an EVD in the perioperative just to decrease the chances of a CSF leak after surgery. Um, so that's my first question. What is your, what is your uh, point of view about that? How do you usually, or you never think that uh, you know, you, you place an EVG on those cases. How do you usually manage that? So when when the tum when we, you have the chance of resolve the, the tumor uh, quickly in the, the few days, uh, I prefer to do uh, the surgery. And so we resect the tumor and we reconstruct the, the skull base. So for me, the, the CSF leak in primary pharyngioma is not an important issue. Uh, I prefer to um, reconstruct the scalpels with three layer technique with fat, fascia lata, and the nasal septal flap. I know that the post-operative MRI is not uh, really um, good because you, you have some fat in the suprasolar in, in sinister, but I think uh, it's a very good closure. Um, and we, I also have some patients uh, from the outback of uh, Argentina that uh, other neurosurgeons uh, put a shunt in this kind of patient and then um, came to us. And um, th this is the way that they resolved the hydrocephalus and then uh, came to us. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I think a shunt can can definitely be avoided in cases like this, as you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, in my opinion, like an EVD, if I'm you know concerned with the size of the ventricle, is more in the in the concerns of increased rates of CSF in cases like this. In terms of your bone exposure, I, I really like what you do because you do something you know similar to to what I do as well, like exposing the medial aspects of the clinoid ICA, so you can get the most lateral window with the medial part of the optic canal as well that i think is very very important and uh dr vargas as you saw in that the bone image that uh, miguel was showing so he exposed the cellar floor but he goes above uh, removing the bone of the prechiasmatic sulcus uh, all the way to the limbus so we can remove that and then the second question for you miguel is actually about the component that was apparently extending behind the dorsal cellar uh, that, uh, you know, apparently, according to your image, was related with the prepontine cistern. So, of course, I saw the relationship of the calcifications with the, you know, BCA and the basilar trunk. And so, of course, that's very difficult, can lead to injury of perforators and everything. Uh, so I think that in that aspect, you push the resection to the mass to the maximum that you would feel safe. But uh, you, you kind of like how much do you push the resection of those, you know, calcifications around those branches or how do you usually decide how to put in that aspect? I think in the, in the fear part of the tumor, you have the membrane of liquids that is your best friend in this area uh, because uh, uh, 
it gives you a good plane of dissection. You can respect the uh, the membrane of the liquid, and you have to push down, push up the the tumor. Um, uh, in this case, the calcification uh, were not a problem because they were um, a micro calcification, uh, and in the surgery, uh, actually, I, it doesn't bother me. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. but, but yes, uh, actually, I, I can sh share you with you uh, other tumors that they are growing uh, a lot uh, in the posterior fossa, and it's the same surgery. You can you have to push up the tumor, and it, they have a good plane of dissection in the inferior part. Mm -hmm. And how do you, I agree, I fully agree with you, especially in the first time surgery, you know, in recurrences, uh, you know, um, how do you, man because in recurrences where you don't have that such a beautiful plane with the liliquist membrane, you know, separating you from the basilar bifurcation, how do you, do you have any tips for that? Because that's a, comp a part that I'm always, you know, when I don't have liliquist, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm always a bit more concerned, you know, with the perforators. Do you have any suggestions or? Yes, recurrences are always um, uh, a worse uh, surgery. Uh, but you, in, in terms of reconstruction of the calvase, you you can um, uh, use the same nasoceptal flap, and you or you also have the the lateral flap uh, wall. In if you can uh, reuse the nasoceptal flap, uh, and in the intradural part. Uh, it's always um, uh, it's not a it's not a good surgery like in the first um, the first chance that you had, uh, but uh, I think you have to dissect uh, with a more microsurgical technique and uh, resect all of the additions to the posterior um, posterior circulation. Uh, also, you have a chance of uh, leaving of leaving uh, a small part of tumors in the posterior circulation also mm -hmm. and then you have to to think uh, if you are going to irradiate this this tumor yeah fully agree well i wonder if any final questions to dr morale dr hakim yes uh, thank you gracias uh, hello dr for... hakim Yes, first of all, felicitaciones a nuestro a, a friend in Argentina. Excellent, beautiful case. I love to see those cases like, like Dr. Quinones. When you see that, you, you're enchanted with his hands and the work. It's beautiful, beautiful. I have one comment, as Diego said. Now that we're doing this craniopharyngiomas in this, through the base of the skull, I think that the reason they do so well is because there's no retraction over the parenchyma. When you go from upstairs, you, sometimes you put spatulas, you move more, you, you manipulate more the, the brain. In this case, everything, you're retracting it to the, to the, to the site of the tumor. So we don't retract the, the brain. I think that's the reason they do so well. And it definitely is the way to go. I wouldn't go... Uh, Peronel or whatever upstairs to, to take one of those tumors. I would always go from downstairs. And the other observation about hydrocephalus, what we've seen is when we have a patient that comes to the, to the hospital with great hydrocephalus and the hydrocephalus is deteriorating the patient, well, we have to treat hydrocephalus before we treat the patient. So usually we go endoscopically. Sometimes they have the cyst. Have you seen? We presented some cases. We break the cyst and sometimes we put the shunt. It doesn't mean you need the shunt afterwards, you can take it, but we're always uh, taking care of hydrocephalus, which can kill a patient if we don't do it. But I think it's a beautiful case and I'm so happy to see everybody around the world is doing uh, this beautiful case. Gracias. Okay, uh, can, can you guys see my screen? I'm, I think I'm sharing my screen, but I can't see it very well from my yeah. computer. You are JP. Okay, so this is. Um, I'm sorry that I can't. I can't. Uh, and and Dr. Hakim, thank you so much for your comments. I really appreciate that. And uh, I think one of the nicest things of this meeting is to have this chance to 
just see, you know, our colleagues from around the globe and many from Latin America, like Miguel, Dr. Hakeem and Diego, and uh, Dr. Vargas, and so many others from so many different countries. So we appreciate very, very much to have everyone joining and, and sharing, you know, pearls. I just wanted to share, Dr. Vargas, I'm, I'm trying here, but uh, I don't know if you guys can see it. Well, maybe it's my computer. I can't scroll this image, but uh, I invite everybody to take can, a look at the chat. I can share it if you want, JP. Oh yeah, Paola, would you do that? Yes. Thank you. So we just have three. I'd like to, in this meantime, I'd like to thank Dr. Morel for joining us today. Miguel, thank you so much for your participation. This is a meeting that we take takes place every Friday and you and your team are absolutely very much invited and welcome to join us every week. And uh, thank you so much for today. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Miguel. Thank you very much. It's an honor for me to be with you. Uh, thank let's, you. Let's share more cases. Absolutely. Absolutely. Pleasure to learn with you. And this here, um, Dr. Vargas, uh, before we finish, you want to share a few words about your symposium that is happening tomorrow? Oh, yeah, thank you. This is our 12th version of our International Awareness Day Symposium on Brain Tumors, and we invite uh, many people from around the world. Uh, some of you know Dr. Dufo, Dr. Garner, of course, Paola from your uh, department is going to talk tomorrow uh, from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. So I already sent by chat the, uh, uh, the link for this session, you are very welcome to do comments on some of the talks if you like to participate. Thank you very much for for share uh, the poster and uh, and the program. Thank you very much. And Miguel, congratulations again for the case and Ala for your first case. Uh, good good cases both. Thank you very much, Paola. We're waiting for you tomorrow. I'm excited. Thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank people. you so I'm much. Excited. Thank you so much, Dr. Vargas, and definitely like we're definitely going to try to join tomorrow. And then we have our meetings for next Monday. Diogo, Andrea, do you have the information? Yeah, just a second. Andrea is sharing right now. Can you see it, JP? Yes, yes. Thank you, Jugo. You want to make the intro? Yeah. So, well, uh, here, uh, everybody, next Monday on 7 a.m., we're going to have the Dr. Danielle Rafai from Emory, Director of Spinal Oncology, that will be presented the Warren Distinguished Lecture on the Spine Surgery in the United States, Macro and Microeconomic Forces at Work. Uh, that's going to be followed next Monday. We're going to have our House of Surgery uh, Symposium here at Mayo Clinic in Florida with uh, presentations, research presentations of our team and many other teams here at Mayo, Florida. And uh, everybody is invited to join us on Monday morning from 6.45 to 8, 8 a.m. And uh, uh, feel welcome. You're, everybody is very welcome to join. Thank you very much for the participation of everybody today. And uh, we're looking forward to, to see you in the near future. Thank you. Have a good one.